Hi, Armilla. This is Isabel. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I just, um, I'll be, um, this is internal. No one's watching us right now, but I want to make sure that I say your name right um, when I introduce you, your last name. Um, do you mind saying that for me? Sure. It's Armella Staley and Gomo. And Gomo. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then um, Kriti, your last name, Rajput, or do I do? Uh, it's Rajput, so Rajput. very short, you. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you had an opportunity to speak with some um, Berkeley Law students during the break. And so we are going to continue our program today. And next up, we are going to continue with an attorney panel. Um, so these are four current practicing attorneys, and um, they're just going to share their background, kind of their paths after law school, um, and possibly answer any questions that you have for them. So I will turn it over to Coalition for Diversity co-director, Isabel Cortez, who's going to be moderating our panel today. Hello, everyone. Well, apparently you could hear what I was saying earlier. Um, here we go with the virtual setting. Um, thanks, Marissa, um, for holding it down. And sorry, it's been such a great conference. Um, today, we're gonna hear from different attorneys. Um, we're gonna share their stories with us. We're gonna share um, what kind of work they're currently doing and hopefully inspire all of you to make sure that um, if you're still confused about law school that you make um, whatever decision that is best for you. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing the attorneys and then we'll go through a, a Q&A section um, with, um, I'll be asking the questions to the attorneys and they'll be answering. And then maybe at the end of this time, students can also send their their own questions. Um, so we'll start with Gregory Washington. Thanks, Greg, for joining us. Um, Greg is at the Greg is a Berkeley alum and um, is currently at the boutique uh, litigation law firm Kicker Bannon Nest and Peters. And uh, Kriti Rajput um, is an in-house counsel um, at App Dynamics, which is a company which is a part of Cisco and is an alum of Santa Clara University. And um, Armilla Stanley Negmo is um, a federal public defender and is also a Berkeley Law alum. 
and Yvonne Chi is um, uh, works in public interest and is a deputy attorney general with the Bureau of Environmental Justice here in the state of California and is also a Berkeley Law alum. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, I think we're just gonna kick it off. Um, I'll have um, Greg maybe start with you um, and then um, you can uh, I'll select who goes next. Um, we'll start with, um, please introduce yourself by sharing where you're from, both hometown and where you're currently located and whether you're a first generation professional and what legal work you're currently doing. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm originally from Chino Hills, California, which is in Southern California. Um, I currently live in Oakland, California. Um, I now work uh, at a litigation boutique firm that mostly does like civil trial and litigation work. Um, but I do have a bit of appellate and then also uh, a fair amount of immigration work in my pro bono practice. Um, so I do a little bit of that too. Um, and I am a first generation professional, but not the first in my family. My sister is a proud social worker. So I have to give her a shout out because she got there before I did. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, Kriti? Hi, everyone. My name is Kriti Rajput. I actually was born in India, but I came to the United States when I was a toddler and I've lived most of my life in the Bay Area. I'm currently based out of Mountain View, California, and I am the first lawyer in my family, but not the last. There's been quite a few that came after me. Uh, I currently work as an in-house generalist, primarily practicing in product, commercial, and privacy counseling at AppDynamics, which is part of Cisco. And um, I love being in the Bay Area, so I wanted to make sure I went to a law school that would allow me to do that. Thank you. And Armila? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Armella Stalian Gomo. Um, I've been practicing for 12 years. I'm a trial attorney at Federal Defenders of San Diego. Um, in that capacity, I represent criminal defendants in the Southern District of California in basically crimmigation matters. So uh, alien smuggling, drug smuggling, illegal reentry after deportation, um, all in federal court. Um, it's a job I really love and I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more later. Um, my family is originally from West Africa, Equatorial Guinea, uh, which was also a former Spanish colony. So I'm a native Spanish speaker. Um, I grew up after Madrid. I lived in Las Vegas and then all up and down the coast of California. And now I'm in San Diego. So congratulations to all of you guys for starting this path and considering attending law school. Thank you. And Yvonne? Hi everybody, my name is Yuting Yvonne Chu and I am speaking with you today from my adoptive home in Oakland, California. Um, and I wanna acknowledge that it's on Chochenyo Ohlone native land. Um, I am a first generation immigrant from Guangzhou, China and I have lived in California um, since I was 10 for the most part. Um, and as a first generation immigrant, I'm also the first generation in my family to have a college or professional degree here in America. Um, I have been an attorney in the Bureau of Environmental Justice at the California Department of Justice since 2019. And in that capacity, I bring lawsuits on behalf of the state and enforce against polluters in support of communities that have been disproportionately burdened by the health effects of pollution, which are primarily low income and BIPOC communities. Thank you so much for um, introducing yourselves. And we're gonna kick it off with this first question. I think since it's a, a question that um, all of you I'm sure have personal connections to, um, we'll have everybody answer it. And then after that, I'll um, pick and choose um, accordingly. Um, why did you decide to attend law school? Um, Greg, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. So um, I decided to attend law school, um, I would say probably about halfway through college. Um, I realized that I was really drawn towards like political science and also law related classes. Um, so I took like an undergraduate constitutional law class. I took a class on the judicial process. And I was really interested in how to, uh, to utilize advocacy to help people. 
So I think that's what kind of drew me to the legal profession. Um, but I wasn't a hundred percent sold on it when I was in college. So I, I took two years and I worked on public policy in Sacramento. Um, so I worked on healthcare reform implementation. Um, and that was something that was entangled in a lot of different laws and policies, both federal and statewide. And I saw kind of the effect that law had on these different and disparate areas. And I thought that this is like further confirming what I thought in, in undergrad, which is that I wanted to go to law school. So I would say that I've been thinking about, I'd been thinking about it for a while, but I finally uh, confirmed that I was going to go after I graduated from college. Thank you. Um, and Kriti? So I was told that you need to be a doctor to be successful in life. So here you have this uh, Indian girl who goes to college and takes all these science classes and is not doing well. I was not a math and science whiz. I tried really, really hard. Um, but I realized like, this is clearly not gonna work for me. No med school is gonna bring me in with the grades I was getting in those courses. So I had to pivot and I found, I really enjoyed environmental science. It was science, but it was still like something that I found interesting. I was taking classes like meteorology um, and ocean biogeochemistry, which I didn't know had is existed in my past. So I graduated with an environmental science degree. And I was like, what can I do with this? I enjoyed politics. I really enjoyed um, envir like environmental law. So I thought I'm gonna go in that direction. Um, I'm not an environmental lawyer, nor am I in politics. Uh, so I'm glad that I kept an open mind and picked a school that had a really like great generalist um, experience so I could try different practice areas and find what I really enjoyed. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not in medicine anymore. I'm, I'm not doing what I thought I would be doing. I also went to law school because I was under the impression that lawyers graduate and they make over half a million dollars a year, which is a myth. It's not true. If you don't know anything about lawyer salaries, please don't hesitate to ask me about in-house counsel salaries happy to answer those questions. Um, but I remember telling my boss that in my 1L internship and he went to the CEO and said, hey man, I need a raise. My intern thinks she's gonna make half a million dollars when she graduates from law school. It, I was mortified. So, so yeah, I had a lot of education uh, that was incorrect prior to going into law school, um, but I have no regrets about my decision. Thank you for being so candid there. Um, and Armila, why did you decide to attend law school? Yeah, um, so I forgot to mention that I am the first person in my family to attend college or law school. And one of the big reasons why I wanted to attend law school was very basic. I wanted a career and not just a job. I'd seen a lot of people in my family go from job to job to job, wasn't stable, wasn't a profession, and I just wanted something different. I knew for a long time I wanted to go to law school. I actually went to a, a high school magnet school that was focused on law-related careers. It wasn't specifically for people who were, to go, who were going to be attorneys. Obviously, there's a lot of different professions that fall under the law. But I've known for a long time I wanted to do that. And I specifically wanted to help communities of color, primarily Black and brown communities, and immigrants like me. So people who looked like me, spoke the languages that I did, and needed the assistance um, of people like me with an education. And I knew that was necessary in order to do the work and be as impactful as I, I hope I'm being now in the lives of my clients. So like Greg, I actually also took two years off in between college and law school and did some public policy work. Uh, I did a fellowship um, through a capital fellows program and learned more about judicial administration. That helped me take some time in between college and law school to decide what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, pay for the LSAT, study for the LSAT and do all the things to make my application that much more competitive. And I will also give a huge plug to the um, law school admission process um, guide because that was my Bible to apply to law school. I'm sure all of you guys that are here at the conference have downloaded it, have printed it, have it in a binder, but I took that with me everywhere and I used that to really help me think about where I wanted to go, how I wanted to go about applying, and then what I wanted to do to the extent that I knew once I got to law school. So that was kind of my shorter path to getting to law school and just wanting something long-term and not just a job, but a career and a profession. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, guide the, the for people of color um, organization offers is also a great resource. So we definitely encourage all of you to download it. And Yvonne, why did you decide to attend law school? Um, I knew that when I was applying to law school that I wanted to use my degree to help protect the environment. Um, I had grown up in Southern Midland, China and in a relatively large industrial city 
The city was, as far as I could remember, up to the age of 10 covered in smog. There was a lot of waterways and the bodies of water next to the city um, had chemical pollutions. The only safe way really to consume water in the city is not through the tap, but to buy bottled water. Um, so lots of drinking water pollution. And I wasn't exposed much to the natural landscape um, of China in my childhood home. I was mainly in a city. Um, and as you might imagine, when I came to the United States and um, just was became more exposed to America's natural beauty and the wildlife that is here, um, it was very impressive. And I also happened to have been privileged to live in a relatively rich suburban neighborhood away from you know, the water pollution and smog pollution um, issues that California also experiences. Um, and it was really until, wasn't until I studied biology in college that I started to, you know, learn more about the natural universe. And I learned more about the environmental health issues that are affecting America and that it's under threat here as well. Um, and that active efforts should be made to protect the environment and protect public health. And at the time I was on a path to maybe get a doctorate in biology, um, but I thought that I wanted to make more of an immediate impact. And I thought that I could do that better as a lawyer rather than in academia. Thank you. Um, I think for this one, we'll start with you, Kriti. And um, the question is, what do you think is the value of pursuing a legal career? And what should people consider before going to law school? I'm going to start with the latter question. Um, I went to law school and didn't understand how much I was going to be making coming out of law school, which I mentioned earlier. So I went to private school, Santa Clara University, and my total debt for a law and MBA degree was $300,000 coming out of law school. That is a lot of debt to take on for someone who wasn't really financially savvy. I didn't know what a 401k was or what a Roth IRA was. I didn't really know what I was doing with my finances. Um, so it was a really big decision and I didn't understand the weight of my decision. I just knew that you had to go to graduate school to make a career because the career I was getting without a graduate degree, I was only getting job opportunities that were paying under $60,000. If, if that, I couldn't even find a full-time job making 60K with an environmental science degree. And I was really like ashamed that I couldn't find a lifestyle uh, to live near my parents where they live in Cupertino, California. I couldn't buy a home in that salary. I was really struggling. So well, I went to law school with a lot of misconceptions. I think it's really important to do your research and really understand what you're getting into when it comes to law school debt and when it comes to what your career options are. But I also think that the value of a legal career is that the world is your oyster. I came out of law school. I was able to go straight in house. I never worked at a law firm. Um, I had the opportunity to go into recruiting should I want to or go into HR. I could go into uh, politics. I could go into and in, like being an environmental nonprofit expert. Like there's so many different career paths you can do. Just seeing the people on this panel, we all have such different career tra trajectories, but law school has opened up those doors for us. You could even be CEO of your company if you wanted to with the JD degree, because you learn so many of those practical skills that you need to understand how to be successful. Um, not that law school is like the only way to make yourself successful. There are many other ways, but law school does open a lot of doors for you and it counts you in this group of people who are professionals and opens up that network for you. Thank you. Uh, Greg, do you want to answer this one as well? Um, what do you think is the value of pursuing a legal career and what should people consider before going to law school? Sure. Um, I think the value of the legal career is that through the process of going to law school, also engaging in sort of like complex and um, very life altering structures. Um, you're able to see things and understand the levers of power. Um, you're also able to understand how things fit together on a broader scale. I think one of the things and, and probably the, the most fulfilling aspect of law school was the exposure to my classmates and the different backgrounds and stories that they had coming into law school how they saw the world and, and, and what they could do with their legal degree and how that really changed my worldview and my perspective on what I could do uh, to change things. So I think uh, as far as like uh, 
you know, an experiential thing. I think I had the biggest years of growth personally during law school because I got exposure to such different types of people and thinking and also like different coursework. So it's really a time, I think, of fantastic growth that takes you kind of from where you are to where you could be and you start to really think about those types of things. Um, I think that before folks go into law school, and this is true of any sort of graduate degree, um, you have to think about how this fits into what your long-term plans are and why you want to go. And I think the latter part is probably more important because you never want to let go of the why that brought you to that point. Because I know uh, just like there are a lot of people who held on to that why and had a full picture of what they wanted to accomplish from their legal career, there were folks that were going into it just because that was the next box that they wanted to check. And those are the folks that are, that are now, even though I just graduated now four years ago, like those are the folks that are unhappy, that are dissatisfied with their careers, that are trying to jump ship and do something else and are saying like, are like constantly loath being a lawyer. And being a lawyer is a hard job to have. So if you are untethered from the why that you, that you chose when you went to law school, I think it becomes exponentially harder. Um, because just the nature of the, of the job is you're not going to win all the time. You're not always going to get the successes that you want. So it, it does have difficult moments, but you have to understand who you are, why you chose to go that path and what you're ultimately looking to accomplish and make sure those things are, are in line before you, you enter into that three years of law school and then that lifelong career afterwards. Yeah, definitely. I always remember the why. Um, Imo, do you want to answer? Um, I I agree with what has been said. Uh, Greg and Creedy made really good points, and I was going to echo what Greg said about you know the uh, the need to have a game plan for uh, before you decide to take on such a large amount of debt, um, and it's. Uh, it is something, it's a big burden and it follows you personally um, to have this debt. And we're not a country at this moment that you know can um, subsidize higher education yet. And um, so it, it's it, having that amount of debt um, will last between you know potentially two years if you go to a firm, if you just are aggressively paying it off or 20 years if you are on some kind of a loan forgiveness program. So I think like the trade-off is you have to be very comfortable and passionate for what you do to sort of be able to shoulder that kind of a burden. And um, so, I mean, the way, the way I dealt with it is um, I knew that I wanted to go into public interest and there is an avenue for public interest loan forgiveness. And so that is the track that I was on. And so I would just advise everybody to really research that um, and, uh, and make sure that, you know, the career path that you have planned for yourself with a law degree can accommodate that. Definitely. And Arula, do you have any thoughts on that question as well? I honestly don't have much to add. I would agree with everything that it said. Um, the opportunities are endless and there's a very small percentage of attorneys that do what I do, which is physically going to court and trying cases and having direct representation. I mean, you can do business, you can do politics, you can do nonprofit management, you can teach in academia. The, it, there are so many opportunities. Um, and with regard to the debt ratio, I don't want anybody to fear the debt. I think we're just telling you to plan for that. Look at law schools that have programs that help with loan assistance. Maybe go to law schools that provide more financial aid or scholarship assistance instead of others that might be ranked higher or that might have other things that you are looking for because you know you want to do public interest work or you want to do government work and you might not be making as high of a salary as those attorneys who go straight into law firms. So again, planning going to these types of panels, talking to any lawyers or attorneys that are in your circle or that are in, you know, within a few degrees of your circle and your friends um, and your professors and trying to figure that out in advance will make you that much happier when you're in law school, that much more likely to finish and then that much more likely to be successful in whatever area of law or um, type of work you pursue after you graduate from law school. Thank you. 
Um, and thank you all for, um, I think, having the students consider the different elements that go into making a decision about going into law school. Definitely important to consider all of them. Um, Armila, why don't we stay with you? Um, and we're gonna go back to law school. I feel like we went big picture and now we're going um, back to law school. Can you share with the students what were some of your highlights and challenges while in law school? Um, a lot of students of color particularly face different challenges um, and also opportunities. So it'd be great to hear from your experience. Sure, um, I loved my law school experience at Berkeley. I think Berkeley Law in particular really touts how wonderful its student body is. And I think that that is definitely representative of those of us who are on this panel and the law school in general. But it was hard. I, I was one of seven Black law students in my entire class. The school has about just under a thousand students. And then in my class, maybe it's about a third of that. Only seven of us were Black. Um, and so it's hard to be the only person of color or the only Black person in a lot of your classes, especially when you are in classes that speak to issues that might affect your community differently or affect you differently as far as the responses that you're going to give or the responses that some of your other classmates give. On the same token, because we are such a small community, we were so close and so cohesive and it really spread across all the students of color and not just the black students. And so some of the highlights of my law school experience were those affinity groups, were those minority associations in law school, um, like the law students of African descent in La Raza, which I was also a part of. And so that really helped me get through and stay motivated and retain my attention while I was in law school. Um, clinical experiences. So um, I did like a death penalty clinic, juvenile hall outreach work. I did a lot of criminal based stuff because I knew that's what I wanted to pursue. But even if that wasn't the profession I went into right after law school, it still made law school interesting and gave me something outside of the, the books and the classes and the studying of case law that we have when we're in class and in seminars. So the highlights was definitely the student body and then within that the student groups, um, the smaller minority student groups that were there and that were there to support us. And also the, the clinical experiences that, that I was able to get those hands on experiences to try out the professions that I think that I wanted to do full time. So don't let the numbers discourage you. Unfortunately, they, continue, they go up and down and depending on the law schools, they have not improved and might not improve by the time, especially those of you who are already in college decide to attend law school, but the community is still there and it's still an amazing experience. And, and like Greg said, it will really be three years of amazing growth that you didn't even know that you'd have during those, those years that you were in law school. Thank you. Um, so we have um, three panelists that went to Berkeley Law and then Kriti who went to Santa Clara, um, still in the Bay Area, but a different environment perhaps. Uh, maybe if you could share with students um, some of the highlights and challenges that you faced while you were in law school at Santa Clara. Sure. Um, so I went to public school all my life and then I wanted to experience private school, even though I didn't get significant scholarships from Santa Clara. I actually got into my dream school on the East Coast, but because of some family problems, I had to stay near my home to support my family um, and find a job nearby so I could work through law school to help provide for my family as well. So uh, in the midst of that, I have no regrets going to Santa Clara. I'm really glad I went there because it put me in an environment where I could work at so many different tech companies and get an experience that I, I love my current job. I love all the jobs I've had thus far, most of which are in tech um, and in various different companies around the Bay Area. And I'm really grateful for those opportunities because Santa Clara opened those doors for me. As far as challenges go, I think it was really difficult for me to learn to network. I wasn't very good at it initially. In fact, I remember I, I pissed off an attorney so much by interrupting a conversation that this person was having. This was an attorney who was also like an Indian attorney and I was really looking forward to getting to know this person, but I interrupted a conversation. And the blowback on me was that I was told not to be, I was, other people were told not to make me a student leader in the South Asian Law Students Organization because of my actions interrupting this person. So number one, that's not okay. I've, I've learned now that that is by no means okay. Um, and I always work really, really hard to mentor students and to help bring students up. One thing that I have learned is when you have mentees, you can't have any expectations of them. So you don't wait for them to reach out. You don't wait for them to like 
ask you for help, you go out to them and you support them. And that's something that's really important because people like me going to law school have no idea what we're doing. We don't know how to connect with professionals. We don't know about sending thank you notes. Those are things that we weren't trained in. Our, our families don't know these things. They don't teach us these things. We don't really know what we're doing with our money. Um, if you're in that bucket, like ask for help, ask for advice, don't be shy about it. And if you don't meet those criteria and someone says something about you, don't let it deter you. Like if I had let that one person make myself worth feel like I, I wasn't worthy of being part of that person's network, then I, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I became the North American South Asian Law Students Association president. So you never know what's going to happen in life. Life takes you in strange ways. Um, but it was a really wonderful experience at Santa Clara. And I, I absolutely enjoyed my four years there. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, and Greg and Colin, you both went to Berkeley as well. Um, do you have anything to add? Um, maybe Greg, we could start with you. Uh, sure. Um, I think that the my biggest, I, I guess, positive point of law school was, um, and I touched on this a little bit with my last answer, was like, the exposure to a lot of different thought processes um, that I hadn't been, uh, I hadn't seen before. So before going to law school, I only knew one lawyer that I actually knew on a personal level. So this is an entirely different environment for me. And it was something to where, and I went to Cal State Fullerton, which is a large state school. Um, so like I went to probably like one of the least prestigious schools at Berkeley <laughs> for my law school class. So like just the, 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 the jump from where I was to what I was doing in law school was just so big. And then getting, you know, bombarded with this new language and this new dialect was very difficult, especially during that first year when you're learning a lot about like how to read cases and how to understand how statutes work and all those things that I, I didn't necessarily have the, the acumen for at first. But the process of going through that and starting to learn and understand it was actually something that I truly enjoyed. And ultimately, I think kind of made me feel better about the decision to go to law school, because as I said, like I was a little apprehensive uh, coming in. And I think um, as far as the most difficult part, like I can I can feel like I can be honest in this space, like I was one of only 10 black students when I went to Berkeley. Um, so for for context with what Armia said earlier, like it, it didn't change a lot. Um, so um, being the only black person in a class where you're talking about, you know, the effects of criminal law on people who are black, when you're talking about issues of constitutional law and like the equal protections clause, due process clause, and having the, the background knowledge of knowing that without the 14th amendment, you wouldn't even be in this class, let alone at the school. So it's it's a very difficult weight to in to to bear and go through law school and try to act normally when you have your peers who kind of like breeze through all this stuff and don't have to carry around that same weight, but you're expected to compete on that same level, that same uh, playing field that they are, but they can just they don't have these burdens and and these difficulties that they have to carry around. So it's a it's a hard thing to navigate to to find your comfort to be able to go through law school, to carry all the all the, the fictions that we tell ourselves about the law and what it is. At the same time, you're trying to learn and compete and do well in these classes so you can get jobs on the back end. Like it's a, it's a lot to, to mentally wrap your head around. Um, and I say that because I want to be honest in this space, but I will say that now being on the other side of that, every single person that I grew up with that I had exposure to, uh, you know, during college and high school, all the folks that people say wouldn't be lawyers, they had all the same talent and capacity to be lawyers. So if anyone ever tells you that you don't belong in these types of spaces, they're afraid of what you're going to bring to the table. And I have to say that you have all the same tools and skills that they have, because I had a lot of imposter syndrome throughout law school. And it's a hard thing to, to deal with. And I, I, as someone who made it through, can tell all of you that you have all the talent necessary to be successful. And I want you to know that here uh, before, I wanna make sure I, I said that before I, I let the mic go on that one. 
That, that was a great way to let the mic go, Greg. Thank you for that. Um, I can't believe we have like a little over 10 minutes left and there's still a lot of questions um, that I think the students would benefit from. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a popcorn style and see how many we can get in. And maybe not all of you will answer all of them, um, but we'll start with this one for Yvonne. Um, what advice would you give prospective law students in figuring out what kind of law they wanna practice? Some students going to law school um, feeling like they know exactly what they want to do and other students going to law school uh, feeling like there's so much to learn and then figure out what's best for them. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, um, and I just want to say what Greg um, just said really resonated with me. It was just really powerful to hear. I also had a lot of imposter syndrome. I didn't feel like um, that my network of people in law school were I thought that they all they all had connections to law somehow. It felt like they were years ahead of me in figuring out the exact type of activities they needed to do to be successful. The, like which like what kind of grades they needed to get. They had mentors in in law already. And I would say, well, um, to that, we the, uh, people of color being underrepresented in law, um, if at all possible, maybe take some time off, out of college after you graduate to maybe work at an area that you think you would be interested in pursuing um, as a lawyer. Um, and I really can only come at this from an environmental perspective, but I know that there have been um, very successful uh, law students who have spent a couple of years or three years working within an environmental nonprofit out of college, either as a legal assistant or a paralegal, some sort of um, position that allows your exposure to law in that field that you're interested in. And to really determine, you know, whether it is the an investment that you're really willing to take. And in addition to determining your interest in that field, you will also be able to build connections and network in that field and to accumulate those mentors that, you know, I found were quite missing for me during, during law school. Absolutely. Um, I'm really looking to go um, to you for this question. Um, it may be um, a little heavy, but I think that it's very important for students to hear um, your thoughts on these. Um, so you mentioned that you were, um, I think, one of seven students, uh, um, Black students at Berkeley when you attended law school. And in general, there are not many people of color in the legal field. It's a historically exclusive um, um, field, unfortunately. How do you navigate this historically white space, both maybe in law school and in, in your legal career and try to make it your own? That is correct. And unfortunately, I will tell you guys that it doesn't get better once you start practicing. So those ratios that you see in law school exist in pretty much any law office that you will join thereafter. You know, you would hope and think that being like a public interest lawyer and a public defender, there would be more people of color even in my office. There are four Black women and no Black men and one Latino male. And that's in a district in an office where our clients are over 90% uh, Latinx and monolingual Spanish speakers. And so what you do is really the same and similar things that you do in law school. Um, you join yourself with allies, you join affinity groups, whether you create an affinity group within your law, within your law office or without, throughout the community, there will always be uh, bar associations, minority bar associations, um, where, wherever you will choose to work, particularly if it's in a larger city, join those organizations, stay committed to your office's recruitment and retention efforts and trying to actively engage your management and the people um, who make those decisions as far as hiring, uh, recruitment, and being the face of your office, try to stay connected to that and try to continually beat a dead horse and let them know we need diversity, we need diversity, and why. Um, I always try to make the connection of, again, our clients are 90% Latino and Spanish speaking. That demographic should be reflected in the attorneys who represent them let them know the nuances and the cultural differences and nuances of being a person of the same race or the, who speaks the same language of those um, clients. 
but then also the diversity, you know, there's study after study about how law firms, law offices, businesses, how they're better, they're more successful, they're more economically successful when they have women and people of color at the table. Um, you know, it's sad that we often have to be the ones to bring those statistics and those studies and those reasons to people's attention. I have no problem doing so. You will decide when and how uh, your comfort level is to bring those. And if you even want to be that spokesperson to do that. And if you don't, maybe that's another set of research that you'll do is researching places that you feel like is more open to those issues that either speaks about it or lives it in the people who they hire and retain in their office. But you will more than likely be the minority. I think uh, for the most part, unless you've gone to like an HBCU or, or, or certain colleges, a lot of you are probably familiar with that aspect, even just being in college. You will see that in higher education, you will see that in law school um, and in your law office, but that should not discourage you because we need to be there and we need to encourage each other to join those organizations and pursue those points of higher education if we're ever gonna diversify it and just know that there are those of us who are there who will continue to support you even if we're not in the office or in the law school that you're at at any given moment. Um, we wanna see you thrive and it's when you join and when you thrive that we all do do better. So stick to it and um, you know, know that it will continue but that it, it can and will get better over the years. Thank you. Um, and Kriti, you're in in-house um, um, and you mentioned that you went straight there from law school, um, which is not um, which is not necessarily something that a lot of people do. Um, so maybe you could speak to how your experience has been going straight um, there. And is it also an exclusively um, why nominated space? And how have you been able to navigate that? I think some of the students would benefit from hearing that. So I definitely experience various different kinds of microaggressions on a daily basis. The latest one was uh, outside counsel called me Krithi Patel. There's no Patel in my name. I'm not a Krithi Patel, but uh, I, I experience these sorts of microaggressions um, and sometimes outright racism in my job on a daily basis, whether it be like in my current one or my previous jobs. It, it's just uh, a way that it's not something that you should be putting up with. It's something that we're trying to address. Like I love Cisco because Cisco is really big on actually actively trying to handle these types of issues. My first week at Cisco was when the executives came out and said Black Lives Matter on a company-wide conference call. And they like really insisted that this is the position Cisco is going to have. And I, I was I was blown away. Like this is one of the first companies I saw. It's a big tech giant that's going out and outright saying this. And I, it was really important to me and it really resounded with me. So I think that it's important to find a space where you feel safe. It's important to promote diversity also, not just for creating a space for yourself, but for the people coming up behind you. So for me, mentorship is really important. I think it's really a big deal for lawyers once they graduate there's a lot of people who don't really like give back and they don't really sign up to be a mentor after they graduate they're like okay i'm done i really need to focus on my work it's kind of like tunnel vision but if you don't open that space for others behind you then you're you're kind of creating like the same system for yourself it's just all the instances that you're experiencing of discrimination or racism are just going to keep being perpetuated by the next generation so I think that's really important. Um, I also think it's really important for law students to understand that law school is not all about grades, it's about networking. I think 70% of law school is about academia and 30% of law school is about networking. Uh, so the way I was able to find my in-house counsel jobs and go straight in-house, and actually a very large portion of my graduating class was able to successfully do that. First of all, I went to a regional law school where some where that kind of activity is more common. I networked with over 100 lawyers in my first year of law school because I really wanted to figure out what do these lawyers do? Do I enjoy what they're doing? Can I see myself pursuing a career in this? And that's how I figured out environmental law is not for me. I figured out like patent law, patent prosecution is not for me. Um, and I was able to kind of narrow down my scope. It's still a broad scope, but I was able to at least figure out what sorts of internships I would find more desirable and I, I loved the internships I did. So I was really lucky, I'm not gonna lie. Um, timing happened to be right for me, but also I really networked and that that made me, that made all these doors open for me that may not have been open otherwise. 
Thank you. And thank you all for engaging with the questions. I think it leaves a little bit more room um, for one last question. And I'm hoping that all of you can answer this one, starting with Yvonne. Um, in light of your experiences in the legal field, what do you think would be your top advice for prospective law students? Um. It's, it's, it's difficult. I think it's, um, I would say don't look, stick to, you know, your plan, stick to what the reason why you went to law school. And um, I was talking about how there were, you know, a lot of people who really had to figure out they, there was a lot of sort of um, uh, mentality that, you know, everybody else is getting those grades, everybody else is getting those prestigious clerkships and internships, and therefore you have to go with it too. Um, but you're perfectly capable of, as Kudi said, networking on your own and deciding for yourself what the best path is for you. So don't let this kind of pressure from um, and, and sort of the pressure from the others and pressure within yourself and the intimidation of being in this space that people don't look like you are, are occupying, don't let that pressure drive you off your path. Thank you. And Greg? Um, you know, I would say that my, my biggest advice is to always be yourself when you uh, choose to go to law school when you become a lawyer. Um, navigating new and, and, and foreign spaces is hard. And especially when you yourself haven't had relationships with lawyers or, or haven't met a lawyer before, it's very difficult. And I think that a lot of folks, to compensate for that, they try to act or sound like the lawyers that they've seen like on TV or like the professor you see in class. And you spend so much time trying to impersonate and sound like and, and put off this, this front as though you're, you're that person that you forget to be yourself. And I think that the important thing about all of this and navigating these spaces is to always carry who you are with you and don't be ashamed of that or don't be afraid to let people see that. Because all the energy that you spend mentally trying to uh, act like what, a, what like the lawyer version of Greg Washington should be is energy that you're not focusing on being the best Greg Washington that you could bring to that space. So I would say always uh, hold on and be, and, and be proud of who you are and all the experiences that you've had to bring you to this point, because that's the only way that you could have gotten here and to, to always let that shine through. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We're at time and thank you to Kriti and Armila for letting me put you on the spotlight when I thought no one was watching. <laughs> um, I'll now hand it over um, to Marissa and then next will be a student panel. Um, I appreciate you giving us some of your, of your Saturday with us. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good luck everyone. Much. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us. And for everyone, we had a lot of people asking. Um, we will be sharing contact information. You know, we'll approve it with all the panelists we've seen today. Um, but we will follow up after the conference to share contact information because um, I know you had more questions to ask these um, wonderful attorneys. So thank you guys again for um, joining us today. And so for our last program today, we are going to hear from some current Berkeley Law students. Um, for a panel about their experiences in law school so far. And so I'm going to turn it over to Coalition for Diversity co-director, Blaine Valencia. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Blaine and I am a second year at Berkeley Law and have the pleasure of serving as a lead for the Coalition for Diversity. Uh, this portion of the conference, um, as Marissa shared, is really dedicated to um, unpacking the student side of things with the student panel. Um, I am thrilled um, to share this platform with individuals uh, that I so, so genuinely admire. Um, and I'll just start it off uh, with just naming the panelists um, and leave the introductions to themselves. Uh, we have uh, third year student, Linda, second year students, Indy and Ariel, and we have a first year student, Jimmy. Um, so to kick things off, uh, would the three of you please introduce yourselves, uh, share where you're based, and uh, the first question is, why did you attend law school? Uh, the order will go is Linda, Indy, Ariel, then Jimmy. 
Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be on this panel and to be speaking to all of you. Um, please do let me know if it's hard to hear me. I am outside, so I apologize for that. Um, like Blaine said, my name is Linda Blair, and I'm a 3 -0. I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I went to undergrad in DC um, and spent three years working before law school. Um, I decided to go to, um, I decided to attend law school. Initially when I was graduating from undergrad, I didn't know whether I wanted to go to law school because I'd always said I wanted to go to law school or whether um, I had actual tangible reasons for going, right? Because law school is a lot of time, it's a lot of energy and it's a lot of money. Um, and so I spent time off really thinking about those reasons for wanting to go to law school and ultimately decided that law was the career I wanted to explore. One, because um, the law is so fluid in that there are a lot of avenues you can take with law. Um, and um, my long-term goals affecting change in the criminal justice system, I think require a law degree. They do require a law degree. Um, and so that's one reason. Um, and then also, you know, I think there's something really inconspicuous about the law and how it maps on to people differently. Um, and the fact that a lot of people just, the law is inaccessible for a lot of people, people in my family, people in my community. Um, and so I really wanted to pursue a law degree so that I, one, can get a better understanding of the law. Jury's still out on that, whether I do have a, a fundamental understanding. Um, but then also to be able to spread that knowledge um, to my family, to friends, um, to my community in a positive way. And so ultimately, um, law school was, was where I needed to be, and, and Berkeley Law in particular, which we'll probably get into later. Okay. I think I'll go next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Indiana. I also go by Indy. I am a 2L at Berkeley Law. Um, I'm originally from New York City and the, from the Bronx. I'm very proud of that. Um, but I've been living in the West Coast, particularly LA and now the Bay Area for about a decade, um, a decade this June, which is insane. Um, so, and I went to Vassar College, which is in upstate New York um, for small liberal arts folks that are, um, if you have any questions about transitioning from a small liberal arts to a big public institution like Berkeley. Um, and why law school? Honestly, I always say that I was born to be an advocate. Um, my grandfather was a political activist in the Dominican Republic, um, and he spent literally his entire life advocating for Black people in DR in particular, because there were many regimes in the Dominican Republic that were very anti-Black um, and violent to Black folks. And so he really raised me up to be you know, an advocate for my community and who I am. Um, so it wasn't a matter of like, what, it was a matter of like what kind of advocate I was going to be, not if I was going to be an advocate. So um, in college, actually, it was my first time that I was exposed to legal advocacy. I interned at a prison for four years, and that was really illuminating, and it um, was work that I was super passionate about. But as a first-gen um, student, I wasn't ready to go back to school as soon as I graduated. So I moved to Los Angeles, um, where I was an educator for 10 years. I wasn't expecting to take 10 years off between um, college and law school, but you know the work was super fascinating and I just loved working with my students. But I think when I turned 30, I realized that it was time if I was gonna do this law thing um, to do it. Um, and ultimately I decided to go to law school because the work I did in prisons was the most excited, the most passionate I've ever been. And I wanted to just go back to that kind of work. Um, and I hope to eventually pursue a criminal justice like policy um, career, um, but I will be starting um, at a big law firm initially after law school, which I think we'll discuss later on. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'll let, I think, Ariel take over. Thank you, Andy. And thank you to everyone that uh, put, put this conference today. Uh, and hello to all the other panelists as well. Um, my name is Ariel, Ariel Perez Mena. I'm originally from Mexico City, uh, but I moved to Utah when I was like 12 or so. Um, and then I spent pretty much my whole time there um, until undergrad and then law school in Berkeley. I'm currently in the Bay though. Um, for me, um, what, I'm, a, I'm a first generation uh, student as well, just put that out there. And for me, for me, law school, um, it really came from after moving from coming to the U.S. from uh, from Mexico, right? So I we came here with my families. It was my mom and my twin brother, 
And uh, we spent like the first six or seven years of our, our, our stay here as undocumented, as undocumented uh, folks. And so um, just like having that experience and living in America like that just puts a lot of things into perspective. And um, I knew that, like I was lucky in the sense that uh, I was able to get I was uh, some sort of uh, legal status and now I'm like a citizen. But um, it, it, it's still like in a conservative state, especially like Utah, um, you have to just like be really uh, quiet about your your citizenship, like no, or your lack of citizenship, I guess. And like no one knew, none of my friends knew. Um, and it's just one of those things that really um, like it. I knew that it was wrong and it was fucked up. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Uh, but I. <laughs> I, I uh, it, it's honestly it's just like it, it's so forming, right? That I I've always wanted to do something about it, and so uh, that was kind of my inspiration to go to law school uh, since since a pretty well since since high school undergrad as well, and I I did a couple of internships in D.C. Uh, one internship with Voto Latino, which is a, a voting rights advocacy group out there, and I I really enjoyed that experience, and then I interned in, in on the Hill one on one summer as well. Uh, and that was just like, I, I kind of like sim similarly to like Linda and some of the things that Andy have said, like you realize that everyone that has these jobs and everyone that's making decisions has a law degree. And so I was kind of like, uh, yeah, like I, I'll probably have to get a law degree. And so I started considering it more, uh, more seriously after that. And then uh, my senior year, I just, um, I decided that I was going to do it. <laughs> started studying that fall, which I'm sure we're going to talk about that later. But now, like uh, I'm still, I'm still interested in immigrant rights. Like that's what I, that's what I want to do, and, and also um, like criminal reform, uh, criminal uh, justice reform, um, because the two are so intersectional, right? That you you really have to to be working in both both areas if you want to make any change in either of them. And um, um, yeah, I mean that that's that's for I, I don't know what I want to do after graduating yet, but somewhere uh, in some some sort of job that I'm able to keep working one or the other. I think I'm next. Hi, everyone. My name's Jimmy. I'm uh, 1L at Berkeley. Um, I grew up in a town called Eldorado Hills, but basically like general Sacramento area. Um, I'm also a K KJD, which basically means I went straight through from undergrad. Um, I graduated from CSU Chico this, uh, this past spring. Um, and I, while at Chico, I was a double major in political science and international relations. And I think, you know, studying political science, it became like clear to me very early on that if you wanted to kind of make an impact or do anything that was impactful, not to say that other professions don't, but it just really felt like the law was one of the most impactful industries that you can get into, even if you were, you know, really passionate about um, environment, you know, the environment or really passionate about even business or startups, it felt like it was the lawyers who played a really big role in, in being impactful in that. And so I think that's something that was really attractive about it to me was that even if you weren't really sure what you wanted to do, whatever you were kind of passionate about, there was a legal field that had to do with that had to do with that. And that you were kind of on the forefront and were in a, in a very impactful space in that. Um, I also was like a tutor. Um, I held instructional sessions for students and I just really in undergrad really learned that I really loved learning a new subject and then trying to explain it I think in a simpler way to students and other people and a lot of the times as a lawyer you're going to have to kind of take something that might have a lot of legalese or legal jargon and be able to explain it to people in a, in a more simple and digestible way and so I think to me that's something that was it's obviously very challenging but it's also super impactful and I think you know, whatever you do, kind of being able to wake up every day and, and be like, hey, I'm a professional and in this one thing. And I kind of, you know, spent years studying and working at this just so I can kind of help someone out who doesn't have a law degree or doesn't have that background. I think that's what made, I think, law school to me really appealing. Awesome. Thank you to the panelists. Those were marvelous answers and marvelous intros. It's great to get just a window into your own perspective and a, a, a bit of a day in the life. Um, we're gonna turn uh, this next portion of the panel to the application process. Um, we'll go backwards. So uh, since it's about the application process, I thought it would be most appropriate to start with whoever is the most fresh from that, and that is Jimmy. Um, so the question will be, what was the most challenging piece of the application process for you? And the second part is, what is what was some of the best advice you received as you started applying to law schools? 
Um, so two pieces, challenging piece and best advice. We'll start with Jimmy, then Ariel, Indy, then Linda. I think the most challenging part for me, um, you know, like obviously LSAT's difficult and you want to have a you know great GPA and everything, but at least like I think those are very clear on what you need what you need to do. Um, I think for me was trying to create this narrative in, you know, with your personal statements. And I think that was something that was challenging because you're, I mean, I think in law school in general, and we'll kind of learn that you're, you constantly kind of need to tell a narrative of why you're doing what you're doing. And you personally understand, you know, why you want to go to law school, but maybe you've never really articulated that before. And so I think that process, it was, you know, challenging in a way, I think, because you're, you're finally having to kind of put it on paper and to explain to someone like your whole life story and kind of why that led you to want to go to law school and do what you're doing. And you'll find out when you, um, when you're in law school and you're applying for jobs, you have to do the same thing. And you're constantly kind of telling yourself a narrative. And I think it is good in a sense that it does prepare you for when you do go to law school, because you, you will have to do that. But I think that was something that was really unique to me, especially as, as a KJD, because an undergrad, I never really had to, you know, even in interviews for certain jobs, I never really had to tell a story of kind of, you know, my whole life. And this is kind of what brought me here and why I wanted to go to law school. Um, so I think that was something that it takes you a little bit out of your comfort zone. I think, especially, you know, you have your personal statement and then you might also write your, you know, your, you should write your diversity statement. And I think that that is even more personal. And if, if you're just not used to having to do those kind of statements, I think it, I think it's just challenging because you don't really know how to go about it. And it's hard because sometimes you're talking about things that could maybe be traumatic. Um, and I'm sorry, Blaine, what was the, the second part? Best piece of advice that you received over the course of the application process? Um, I think I, I, to apply widely, I think like for sure helped me a lot. And um, as far as studying for the LSAT, like someone told me to kind of treat it like a job. Um, I think that helped a lot. And I think it really, it really can kind of be like a job. And especially when you think about, you know, you could be getting money for schools and stuff. I think you should really look at it that way. Um, but yeah. Um, so the most difficult, I mean, obviously the LSAT is hard. Uh, so I'll echo that. But I think um, I, I think for me, when I was applying, it was about like making like a schedule and like just following, following through with it. Because at the time that I was applying for, for law school, I was a, a senior and I was like, you know, trying to graduate. I was like writing my honors thesis and I was um, and I honestly decided that I was going to take the LSAT um, in like August. <laughs> I was going to take the like the October LSAT or whatever in August. So I only said for like two months. Uh, so it was just uh, I think that the treat it like a like a job thing is like it's like for real, especially if you are if you're an undergrad trying to go straight through like you have to just uh, make the tough decision and like cut your social life and cut your <laughs> A lot of your, a lot of your, you know, extracurricular things that you would do to just really focus on, on the ELSA and focus, focus on, on your personal statements and your letters and everything. Because um, if you're on a tight timeline like I was, then it, it's really difficult to to put a good application together. Um, and I think for my best advice uh, with rec with letters of recommendation, don't be afraid to literally tell your recommenders like what you want them to talk about, right? Like. Uh, letters of recommendation are like, I, I think probably in my opinion, like if you're on the edge, like probably really important and you want to make sure that like your, your recommenders are not just like generically talking about you or like they're all just like saying the same thing over and over and over again. So like be specific about like what you want uh, your recommender to talk about and like how, how you want them to talk about you because uh, you should want every single piece of your application packet to be like, like about you, but from a different perspective or like a different ex different experience of yours uh, like kind of like a puzzle just you know putting this piece together for you so don't, don't i mean it's like scary but don't be afraid to do it i think i i'm next right um so yeah i think for me um the most difficult part um outside of the things you i i put them in i put these things into buckets you can't control because for me standardized testing and my gpa are just like 
these are numbers, these are arbitrary numbers and, you know, how you perform in these like two specific um, metrics don't really define how you will perform in law school. And so for me, I just like, that was difficult, just like um, getting those scores or just like feeling like my GPA, because both were mediocre, my both my GPA and my LSAT score, both mediocre. And so just like kind of pushing myself to just like dare to apply to top schools, even though like I didn't have the most competitive numbers. So I, I, I kind of echo what Jimmy said, like apply broadly, don't let these like medians, like, you know, LSAT medians or LSAT um, GPAs, um, yeah, median of GPA, like determine where you apply. Because if I were to stop that, then I probably would have not applied to Berkeley and I wouldn't be here. So I just say, just dream big, um, but really just like the mental, just like for, for you, like for me, it was really um, like, I just was like tired, <laughs> like applying to law school is exhausting and I had a full-time job. And so to treat the LSAT like a full-time, you know, like a full-time job was impossible for me. So I try to think of applying to law school, like a part-time job. Um, so I try to do like 20 or 15 to 20 hours a week on like law school stuff um, between like, I think February to, I ended up applying to all of my schools by November. Um, and so like for the, that period of time, I was just like doing 15 to 20 hours, whether it was like studying for the LSAT or working on my personal statement or working on my diversity statement. And that's just exhausting and brutal. And so um, both emotionally, because I was like, why am I working this hard? Um, in my mind, I just kept going back and forth in terms of like not being de like deserving enough or not like um, like my scores like hampering me. And so um, that and also like physically exhausting because I had to do like 20 hours on top of a full time work schedule. Um, so I think those two things were the biggest, um, you know, challenges, but you persevere and then um, you apply by November and then wait months, um, which is another uh, set of um, anxiety inducing time. But overall, you do feel accomplished by the time November comes. And I think the biggest piece of advice, I just want to echo what um, Ariel just said about treating it like a puzzle piece. Um, every single part of your application needs to be different. Um, I saw a question in the chat about um, how like, what's the difference between your personal statement and your diversity statement? And the way that someone told me in terms of like, uh, like how to think about it, like your personal statement is why law school um, and like why the law in general, and then do that through like, you know, a very um, you know, story, like storytelling is super important, I think, for both your personal and diversity statement. But your diversity statement is how you would contribute to a law school classroom. So what about your experiences and who you are would make you a unique person in the law school classroom? So thinking about those two things in like different ways will allow you to tell different stories about who you are and kind of treat it like a puzzle piece. And don't forget that you are going to school or you're trying to apply to go to school to be an advocate. So in every state step of the way, you should be advocating for yourself. Like for me, I didn't get into Berkeley until April. And so by mid-March, I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to email them with an update to my application. I'm going to email them with an update to my resume. I'm going to email them with like different things that I've been doing since I applied in November, because I want to make sure that whoever's in the admissions office has as many tools who's advocating for me to be admitted, right? You want to make sure that you give them as much evidence. And I knew that I had mediocre scores. And so like, I was like, I got into this, like the SEO program, which is like an academic program, like admit me, trust me, I'll have resources. Don't be worried. Um, so you want to make sure that like at every stage, you're just advocating for yourself um, because that's who you will be as a lawyer. So I think treat your application like a puzzle piece, advocate for yourself in every stage. Those were the biggest pieces of advice that helped me. Cindy keeps saying her scores are mediocre, but she's far from mediocre. So y'all should know that about her. Um, I echo what everyone said so far, really good advice. Um, as far as uh, what was challenging for me in navigating the application process, I kind of echo Jimmy in like um, the personal statement piece. Um, I think it was a challenge to figure out what part of my story I wanted to tell and what part of the story I thought would um, resonate with the schools that I was applying to or the people who were looking at the application. Um, and, you know, I think for people of color in general, right, like a lot of what you're doing when you're applying is you're bottling up you know, your trauma, your experiences, um, you know, a lot of pain, right? And you're putting it in this like cute little box and putting a bow on it and you're giving it to 
um, admissions offices who a lot of time are not people of color, right? Um, and so it's sometimes difficult to figure out what part of the story you want to tell that um, does does its job, right? Gets it gets your point across, but also does so in a way that can make sense to people who may not necessarily, um, you know, come from your same background or have your same experiences or um, resonate with your identities. And so I think for me, that was difficult in thinking about which story I wanted to tell um, that would do all of those things. Um, in terms of the best piece of advice, um, definitely echo Indy in terms of advocating for yourself. Your application is all about bragging on yourself. And again, as people of color, we have a hard time tooting our own horn, um, but that's what your applica application is about, right? It's about, look at me, I'm a badass you know, and this is why, A, B, C, right? And so um, I think you have to get out of your head this guilt that you may have about saying how excellent you are um, because that is what the application is about. So absolutely advocate for yourself. And the other thing I would say is like, as much as you can prepare ahead of time, um, no shade to anyone who was last minute. I understand um, the throes of the world put you in that position, but um, if you can prepare um, and do things early, it'll save you a world of trouble at the end, right? Now, that's not to say that admissions are gonna, not gonna take time, right? Because you can prepare early and they still take months, but you at least wanna know that you did your part on time. So prepare early as much as possible, organize, sit down, make a schedule, say, I'm gonna spend this many hours doing, right? Like Indy said, I'm gonna spend this many hours this week doing um, law school stuff, doing applications, doing LSAT studying. Um, you really have to build in that time, especially if you're um, doing undergrad work, right? Or if you're working um, as a professional and you're still applying. So that's what I would say. Incredible answers. Um, I feel personally ready and equipped to apply to law school again. Um, so thank you all for your wonderful advice. Uh, we're going to pivot a little bit and talk a little bit more discreetly about um, the law school experiences. Um, I have a very broad picture, uh, big picture question, um, and this is, what is it like being a law student of color? Uh, anyone can answer, um, and we can go uh, with whoever wants to speak. I can get started. Um, I, sorry, Adian, <laughs> um, but I think, uh, so there's like, you know, like I can say like positives and negatives about um, this experience. But ultimately, I think for me at Berkeley, being a law student of color, I love the law student of color community at Berkeley. I'm a member of La Alianza here at Berkeley. I'm a member of the law students of African descent. And the amount of love and mentoring and support that I've gotten from like two and three L's when I was a one L um, to the amount of like well, I try to pour in that same kind of energy to um, the one else that we have this year. Um, it's just like, I think that that's what makes Berkeley in general unique. Um, I think the student of color community is strong. I think that we help each other, like as I'm a student, because I'm a student of color leader, um, I can see, I see a lot of like cross affinity group collaboration, a lot of like different groups supporting different initiatives, because we all understand that when one of us wins, all of us wins. And so um, I think in general, I think that's really beautiful. Um, I guess the negative parts of it, and maybe I should have started with the negative and ended with the positive, but whatever. Um, the negatives are just like, as a student of color, you're, especially as a leader, um, you're kind of tasked to kind of, you know, create community and, and build community. And so as a 2L, I am pretty busy, um, you know, as a co-chair of La Alianza to make sure that I'm building community and building programming for 1Ls. And that's can be a little overwhelming on top of your academic schedule and your other responsibilities. And so I do think, and then I think this is true for any law school. I do think that students of color um, carry a little bit more of a burden in terms of um, creating community, advocating for themselves, pushing administration to do better and support students better. So um, that's, I guess, like the catch of it. But ultimately, um, I think the community is so beautiful and it's really an honor to be a part of the different communities of color that I'm a part of at Berkeley. Yeah, I would also echo, I think the part on that there is some sort of, a, there is 
there tends to be a burden and I, it does seem like students of color and even faculty of color are sometimes overtaxed because you know if, if you don't push for this initiative or if you don't do this or that you know who will but also i think going to berkeley and you know i came from a town that was like very predominantly white school i went to in chico is still super white and i think coming to berkeley and seeing like how powerful all these students were and how like loud their voices could be and 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 what they could do and even mentorship and just how hard you have these two l's and three l's that you know, want to be your mentors or how much they'll fight or, or work to kind of make a space for you. And, and so even just to say that two L's and three L's, like I get that it's hard, but it's definitely, I think appreciated. And I think it definitely makes it easier for the next class. And then, you know, like we want to do the same things. And I think that's so cool is because you see not even students, but attorneys who it's like, they've become very successful and all they want to do is look back and help and like, think about how they can kind of help it and keep that door open for everybody else. And so I think you know, one really good takeaway is how inspiring it is because that's something I didn't really realize we could do until I came to Berkeley and it was like, you can, like there are people that will support you and allow you to start any org or do anything that you want to kind of like push these initiatives. And it's not always necessarily always easy, but you like, you can do it. And I think that that is like so inspiring and it makes you, you know, at least from my perspective as a 1L, like that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be to the 1Ls coming next year. And you kind of just keep paying it forward. And yeah, it can, it is taxing, but I think over time it will get, it will get easier. And I think it's definitely, you know, one of the most rewarding things. Um, I'll go. I mean, I echo again, what everyone has said. Um, I think definitely the positives being a part of affinity groups, um, you know, it's really, it's really like, it really helps foreground you and keep you grounded when like, you know, non, um, stuff that you don't feel really comfortable about, right? Like the law in itself, you know, has some very, um, racist elements. It has some sexist elements. It has some homophobic elements, right? Like all of those things are, um, present in black letter law. And so it can be uncomfortable being in a classroom talking about these things so cavalier um, and to have affinity groups that, uh, surrounding people who understand your experiences and can relate to you um, is really heartwarming. And I think that that is being a part of Lasad and WAP um, has foregrounded my experience at Berkeley. Um, but I think that it's also important to remember that it's very taxing, right? To be a person of color in law school in general, not just at Berkeley, um, because you are dealing with what I just said, right? All the isms. And you are thinking about how these um, things map onto people, right? How the law applies to different people differently. Um, and, and sometimes you may not have an outlet to explore those things. And so um, it's really important to remember to take care of yourself, right? To really be invested in self-care, right? Like uh, therapy, I'm in therapy. It's been really helpful for me to be in therapy. So if it's something you're thinking about, you should absolutely check it out, right? Um, involving yourself in things that bring you joy outside of doctrinal work, right? Like bringing those things to law school and continuing to do those things, um, I think is really important. Um, and so I would definitely say that you should um, surround yourself by people who get you, right? Um, and you should make sure you have outlets outside of school um, to kind of release, I know I do, to release the frustrations of, um, of dealing with the law. Sometimes it's just tiring. Um, and so it, that's definitely important. Yeah, I mean, not, not to add uh, too much because I, I agree with everything that's been said, but uh, I think it's it's tiring, but it's also like um, like the best part as, as well, especially at Berkeley, uh, because uh, the, the communities are a little bigger than they are in other law schools. And so, uh, or proportionally anyway. Um, and there it's it's hiring because yeah like you you're expected to basically run the school uh like for example the folks that are running this conference right now you know they're students and they're just like expected to do this for free and and, and they do it because you know they love the community and they want to help out and i think all of us are on the same boat like uh, I, I i i came to law school because of the of the uh the community of berkeley law uh, berkeley law when i visited and they were so supportive uh, and they helped me with with my with my letter for reconsideration uh, they 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 kept hitting me up throughout the summer to check in on me, uh, see see what see what was happening, and um, 
and I, and and at the end, once I, I accepted and everything, like I, I said to someone that was helping, with, I was like, "Thank you," you know, and 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 the, and she was like, "You don't have to say thank you. Just just make sure you pay it forward." And so I think that's that's, that's like the attitude, and that's like the uh, how most like students of color at Berkeley like see their their time at Berkeley, and it's it's amazing to be a part of this community because of that. Um, but yeah, I mean you know like academically the the law is racist professors say some problematic stuff all the time students say you know everyone's like smart or whatever but people be saying hella problematic stuff all the time and um it's tiring because that that that's that falls on students of color too to have to call that out and to have to to have to teach uh other students or teach a professor or to even teach uh the dean uh, and other administrators about the the issues that we're facing and so you know, it's, it's the best, but it's also uh, not the best. I love that. Um, I think just something important to raise, just to add a little bit of context to what the panelists have shared, is that just given the exclusionary nature of the legal profession, a lot of the work of students of color um, is done to ensure that these communities survive, because each year there's a lot of variety um, in whether or not admissions one year happens to admit uh, seven black students as other panelists have shared or, or in the next year admit 40, right? So um, that labor, it's valued um, and like shout out to all the panelists for putting in um, so much work to ensure really the continuity and survival of your community in the setting. Um, and with that, we have another question. <laughs> um, could you all describe something meaningful that you've done in law school? Again, another general one, but um, I hope you could all just provide a nice little story about something that's been meaningful for you. Um, I'll start. Um, so I think one of the unique things about Berkeley Law is that um, you get to, as a first year, you get to get be involved in slips and journals. And slips are student initiated service projects, something to that effect. They're basically clinics for one else. Um, and so I would say one of the most meaningful experiences I've had at Berkeley has been my the slip that I was involved in as a first year. Um, it was called um, Community Restorative Justice. And the slip involved going to San Quentin State Prison weekly and engaging um, with the, the men who are incarcerated there um, about what restorative justice looks like, right? About um, conflict resolution, making not only, right, the survivors of, um, you know, the perpetration whole, but also the incarcerated men and their families and their community um, whole. And so it was just a valuable experience because it really meant a difference to them, right? For us to be able to come and, and spend time with them and to engage with them and to learn more about them and to know that they are more than just the sum of their experience that landed them in, in, in part, you know, in prison. Um, and, you know, it's an experience I'll hold on to forever and it really deepened um, my, my long-term goal to really think about um, what does abolition of the penal system look like, right? Um, and it starts with talking to the men and women who are incarcerated and, and learning from their experiences. Um, and so I would say that that was really, really meaningful outside of um, being involved in the affinity groups, which has been meaningful throughout since, since I got to, even before I got to Berkeley, um, that has been absolutely a meaningful experience as well. I'll go next because it's like literally the same, pretty much the same story. Um, but it mine mine as well as a slip. Um, I'm a part of the post conviction advocacy project, and that um, slip essentially pairs you. So I, I alongside two other law students, um, meet with a, our client um, pretty much every week, and have been doing this for a year and a half, and will continue to do this for our entire three years of law school. Um, but we meet with a client um, who's facing he ha he has a life sentence at St. Quinn and we're basically preparing him for his next upcoming parole board hearing. Um, and to me, that has been super meaningful because the classroom can be dry. The classroom can be so divorced from like reality. Like sometimes I feel like we talk about, especially in, like when I took as a 1L criminal law, there were so many things we discussed, but it was like the the people were the, like the doctrine was very far removed from like people's lived experiences and that to me was so annoying and like frustrating about law school is that we would talk about these like really intense topics like in kind of like this like meta like 
way, but without realizing that these topics have real life experiences and real life impact on mostly people of color's lives. And so uh, participating in this lit made me kind of like help me with that frustration, right? Like I was like, I'm putting these skills to test. I'm helping support someone um, who was pretty much failed by our car by our justice system and being punished by our current carceral system. And so um, I've been doing it for a year and a half. I'm going to keep doing it until I graduate. And it's the, the most meaningful thing I've probably done in my life, let alone law school. Um, just cause I was able to, I am able to develop a really, um, meaningful and intense relationship with my client who I've known for years at this point. Um, so that's very unique to Berkeley. Berkeley allows one else to start doing that. Um, and was one of the reasons why I chose Berkeley. Cause like, a lot of schools, I think, don't let you do that, that kind of direct service work until you're a second year. Um, and so the fact that I was able to do that helped me deal with the BS of like law school classroom and like learning the doctrine. I, I can um, I can share some thoughts as well. I, I think I, I echo what Andy and Linda say about um, like, like the practice, the practice opportunities that we get are definitely like the most valuable experiences we have period or at least i've had like uh working in the summer working this semester with uh with another public uh, defense office or even the volunteer experiences that you get to have either through slips or, or different opportunities that you just hear through the community um like those 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 interactions with the clients and those those instances in which you're actually working and, and being and helping clients and helping people um gain a little bit more rights or, or whatever it may be uh, uh, is what makes law school worth it. Um, I think for me, I, I volunteer with an organization and we just like constantly are, are, are helping people submit like their parole request uh, from uh, immigration detention centers. And I mean, for anyone that knows, like when you're uh, stuck, it's like, it's really, really hard to get a uh, uh, bail. Like it is, is uh, um, like, about uh, just be able to get on uh, on bond, um, and uh, we submitted like that that summer. I submitted I don't, I don't even know how many applications I submitted, but it was like this one family that I was going back and forth with for a couple of weeks, and it was like coming back, uh, and it was just like continuing like back and forth, and, and we we submitted more stuff for them, and then like two months later, uh, like the the family hit me up and they were like, hey, like they released them. Thank you so much for everything. And it was like, and you know, it's like everything, everything that like uh, put it like had gone wrong, like like everything was all of a sudden like great. It was like the happiest moment, you know, like I had in law school. And it's just like it, it those little victories like just make it worth it and make you want to keep fighting and make you want want to do whatever whatever it is you can do uh, to help people in whatever area you want to do it. Yeah, I think this. I mean, maybe a little bit of a different angle than than um what a lot of like the answers were but something that i think that at least to me was meaningful or you know something that's really interesting when you go to law schools you're that you're literally able to email you know you can cold email an attorney and say like hey like we went to the same you know you're an alumni from this from berkeley or like they were in lasad or you could see other diverse attorneys and you can get in contact with them and They'll, some of them will spend like an hour or like 40 minutes or sometimes just 20 because obviously they're very busy just talking to you and trying to, um, I don't know, I think you just really, something that's really cool is as soon as you kind of go to law school, you're able to just contact professionals that are doing what you want to do and talk to them and see like how excited they are to kind of share their path and what they've done. And so I think that's something that I would definitely recommend people do and something that's been so meaningful to me is like, yeah, it's networking and, and none of the attorneys that I really talk to it's not like any of those directly led to me getting a job, but being able to just talk to different attorneys of color that kind of went down your similar path has been huge because you, you just get a different perspective of, you know, people that have kind of already done what you did before. And so if I had to plug that, I would definitely say, please, please do that. When you guys do go to law schools, try and reach out to some of your alum and just get an idea because, you know, don't be offended if they can't, if they don't get back to you because they are super busy, but if they do, like, it's honestly such like it's like gold being able to hear them talk about and learn from their experiences and stuff and i think it helps you a lot more than you realize it does um and it may be more later down the road but they're they're like just buckets of advice that want to help you out great so uh the next question is going to talk a little bit uh more about what's kind of on the horizon 
you're all currently law students, um, but people go to law school to enter the legal profession or do legal work. Um, the question is, how do you weigh your priorities for the legal careers that you are pursuing? Um, for example, um, some might like tie guilt for choosing a career that makes a lot of money, but also has a, a community to, to be concerned about. Um, or some public interest folks live with that anxiety about providing despite doing work that they're truly passionate about. Um, I'd love to hear from you all about how you kind of reconcile these sometimes competing interests. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, you know, I think that that's a real concern. And I think that, um, you know, that people have their opinions about what you should be doing, right? What um, path you should be taking and, and why. Um, and so I think that I, I definitely understand that, um, that that's a real issue. I think that one of the things that you have to consider, right, is whether the people who are telling you that you should do public interest or that you should do big law, um, whether they're going to be able to fulfill um, the responsibilities and the goals you set for yourself, right? And the answer to that is a resounding no. Um, and so you have to stay steadfast in what you know you want to do, um, the goals you want to reach, right? Um, you know, I think that there's guilt tied to it because people of color are supposed to be going into public interest, are supposed to be public defenders, right? Are supposed to be helping our communities, but there are a multitude of ways that people can help their communities. And a, a good way to help your community is financially, right? Is bringing in um, income. And especially like people have no idea about the financial considerations, about the f familial obligations one might have and why they're, why they're deciding to pursue a, a particular legal field. Um, they have no idea about your short-term and long-term goals, right? And how you wanna get there. Um, and so I say all that to say that they are not gonna be able to live out your dreams or your goals or your responsibilities. And so, um, you know, you should really take their advice, um, take, take as much of it as you paid for it, right? Um, and and you, you didn't, right? So um, you, should, you should be careful to, you know, really think, to, to really take into to heart people's suggestions about what you should do with your career. Um, and you should think about what it is that you actually wanna accomplish for yourself um, and, and how to get there. I know me personally, I'm going into big law, um, you know, eventually, um, and, and long-term I want to do criminal justice work. Right. Um, and people all the time tell me like, how are you going to, how are you doing this? Because you're a black woman. Right. Um, and I say, I'm doing this because I'm a black woman. Right. If we're talking about diversity and inclusion and how the legal profession is 88% white male, um, then we need black women we need brown folk, we need people of color in these different realms that have been ostensibly white male. Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm, I have a thicker skin, right? So I'm able to, to brush it off because it, these people are not paying my bills. But I think that you should also be careful in terms of just taking it to heart and, and to remain true to what it is you know you wanna do, right? And don't get sidetracked by people's opinions um, because, because you know, they're not going to be able to navigate your life for you. Only you'll be able to do that. I, I can uh, go next because I, I want to just like kind of share the same perspective, but from a public interest uh, point of view, because I am pursuing uh, a public interest career after law school. And it's the same thing, right? Like, uh, like I'm very aware of like the financial constraints that could come from a public interest career. Uh, like I'm a first generation student, you know, uh, immigrant. Uh, I do not come from a family that has money, you know. Uh, definitely like one of the worst is like, you know, I gotta help my help out my mom in, in the near future, I gotta help out my family and all that stuff. But, um, so, and so that's a lot of pressure always uh, from like family or uh, community, like mentors, you know, whoever it may be, who are just like, just do big law, just do big, just, big law, just do big law, just do big law. And it's like a similar thing, like, uh, don't you, you gotta, you gotta take what they say, right? Especially if it's people you trust and, and take those opinions into consideration and really weigh them out and try to understand where they're coming from. But just like, uh, just like if you go, just like if you don't go big law, you know, like who, who's gonna be paying your bills, 
if you if you do go big low and you hate your life and you hate every single day of like the type of work you're doing like those people are not going to be doing your job like at the end of the day you're going to have to be doing that yourself and so you really have to uh take that into consideration when you decide uh, what you want to do and also take like keep in mind that a law degree is flexible right uh you can start in public uh your public defense go into policy go into government go back to public defense if you really want to uh, and if you really want to you can go into private you can go private public then back to private like it's just about making those connections and making sure that you uh, that you are a, a good worker everywhere you go and that you always uh, turn in quality of work and um yeah i mean i think it's it's you gotta just uh it's personal but you you gotta just you know yourself you trust trust what you what you think is right yeah i'll go next since this is a y'all perfectly segued my answer. Um, so I also, alongside Linda, will be going into a big law firm this summer and hopefully starting my career in a big law firm. Um, I did about 10 years in, in nonprofit um, prior to law school. And so for me, um, I just want to push back on the idea that nonprofits are just like perfect, um, these perfect places where you do these, like, I think the work is amazing and it definitely keeps you at like, grounded and alive, but nonprofits also experience lack of diversity. Nonprofits also experience, um, like, I feel like as a person of color in nonprofits, I was, I experienced a lot of like microaggressions. And then also on top of that, I wasn't compensated for my labor adequately. And so all these things, I will just preface by saying that um, that's kind of like what motivated me into like just considering a big law job, because like my only experience prior to law school was in nonprofits. And so um, I did the SEO fellowship, which is a in the summer of your zero L, you pretty much intern at a big law firm. And I did it mostly because I, again, had a whole career in nonprofit and didn't wasn't ever exposed to big law. Um, and over that summer, um, although there were a lot of cases that I wasn't um, maybe a big fan of, um, there were a lot of cases that I thought was super interesting um, and made me just in general interested in the work. Um, for better or worse, these big law firms are hired by clients to solve really difficult questions. And so um, the work is really novel and the work is really interesting. So I will just um, say that, like, I think although corporations are, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that they're like great because they're not. Um, they're definitely like they have represented a lot of clients that they probably shouldn't have. I think the work is interesting and is cutting edge. So those two things can also be true, right? Like where the work is interesting, but also maybe not so great. Um, but I just want to kind of co-sign everything Linda said about um, thinking about your own family as a part of the community. Um, as someone who did 10 years in nonprofit work, I just, the income that I was making wasn't sustainable for me and was actually one of the main um, drivers for me applying to law school and just kind of like, you know, potentially create, get an income in which I can support my family. I am my parents' retirement plan. Like they do not have a retirement plan outside of me. Um, I, my, I both while in law school, I also support both of my brothers who are currently in college. And so all those things are something that for me were a main driver into pursuing a job that gave me more income. And mostly it's so that I can set up my family for success. I don't see a like long-term goal in big law um, in terms of like being there for forever. Um, but it's something it's, it's an, it's a means to an end, right? I need to be there in order for me to support my family. But also I think the training that a big law firm gives you will set me up for success so that I can be the best advocate I can be to do criminal justice policy work down the line, to work at a nonprofit, maybe in a leadership setting in which I can really just like advocate for myself and, um, and for others. I also think at a big law firm job, you can do the pro bono work you do as well as the, um, you can be a part of boards of nonprofits as a like junior associate. Um, so those are different ways that you can actually be an agent of change while you're working at a big law firm job. So I think that there's ways that you can make money um, and also be a part of your community and give back to your community at the same time. Um, but I do understand the guilt and I do understand the concern because that's something I deal with every day. But ultimately, my family's like well-being was the driving force. And so that that's why I decided to pursue this career. Um, but I don't see it long term in terms of me being there forever. I just see it as something I have to do for now in order for I to be set up for success in terms of the future. But I get I get the tension. So for the remaining um, couple of minutes that we've got, uh, we're going to 
uh, do a little bit of a popcorn style like they did with the last panel. Um, just a, we've got a great array of questions being presented um, in the Q&A um, and I'd love to just have more directed folks answer this. Um, so I've got one for Ariel. Um, the uh, question asked by uh, Maybell Tsing um, asks if uh, you struggle, do you struggle with, uh, here, let me just read the full thing just because it's so poetic. Um, as a prospective applicant, I have taken a long break since school to work as a community organizer for the last decade. I struggle uh, applying for law school because we've seen how the law and or law enforcement has failed our communities. Do any of you struggle with that in law school, seeing how your investment in learning the law perpetuates inequality. And in these challenging moments, how do you stay committed? We're gonna keep it tight and just have Ariel do it. I know, <laughs> I'm sure all of you all would have such enriching answers, but because of constraints, let's stick with Ariel. Yeah, I think that um, like this definitely is suppressing uh, going to class sometimes, especially like different classes, right? Like, like Andy said, cr criminal law, because you're talking about this very hard issues uh, from an abstract ways and with a criminal procedure for example talking about uh police power right and you you have to talk about it in such a superficial manner um and so it's definitely depressing in that sense uh, but i think uh it, it's kind of you got to think about it as you're learning you're learning skills that you're going to apply to your own uh work later on and so i think that's the most important thing just being able to um to think about it that way and the way I combat that throughout school because there's really no other ways uh, staying involved with um, with either volunteering my time uh, with the different organizations or just externing like I, I did an externship last semester with uh, like a small impact litigation um, um, nonprofit. I, I'm externing with uh, the Alameda County Public Defenders this summer or this semester and I'm probably going to try and extern both uh, semesters next uh, next year because I just I know I just I need that client interaction and I, I need to be actually be helping someone to remind myself or, or to keep me motivated <laughs> to, to get through with law school. Great up next uh, we've got one that I'll throw at Linda. Uh, what does your day-to-day -day look like as a law student? Is Linda okay? I think she froze. Okay, um, let's do Jimmy then. Yeah, um, I, I would always, I always hated this answer when you asked attorneys because they would always say this, but every day is different. And it, honestly, it does feel like every day is different, but I will, you know, elaborate. Um, I guess, you know, you, I mean, really wake up, check emails it really depends on kind of what what you're doing i'm honestly not in a not in a bad way but i'm definitely like involved in a few things so i think that my schedule is um sometimes a little busier um but i mean it is it is hard to say because i really don't feel like i have a set honestly a set schedule which i feel like you should i think it's really good um like working out in the mornings or doing some sort of exercise like i'm can talk about it all the time and I'm obsessed with my Peloton. And so I think if like, I think just setting routines around your classes where you kind of have breaks outside of that and you can kind of do something else where you're not um, focused on classes. Um, besides that, I mean, I have class from like two to 5 p.m. on most days, which is actually a really relaxed and, and pretty chill schedule. And, and even though I'm more of a morning person, I like to get up early, it's nice because I'll just wake up early do my readings and exercise like eat and then and then go to class um as far as like i feel like a lot of people are thinking you know in law school you're going to be up till 1 a.m or all pulling all nighter studying and stuff i honestly didn't do that once i don't think i stayed up past midnight studying once um this first semester and everyone does things differently but like i will never give up sleep for for studying and i don't think that's something that you know if you don't want to do that you don't have to and i think you'll be okay um i've seen a lot of good advice that says just kind of treat it like a job and you you know maybe you start at like nine study do all the work that you need to do go to classes and then once you're done for the day and you've already done your readings just kind of cut it off and have some time to just enjoy yourself but yeah me personally i don't think i have a super set schedule but i would say i don't think it 
is as busy or is as bad as I think people put law school on to be. Hey, Linda, are you okay? Yes, sorry, my um, internet connection is just unstable. No worries. I'm going to throw uh, this question at you. Um, so this question asks about um, how to find mentorship. Um, and the time frame that it looks at is both during the application process or also during law school. So just a general question. How do you go about finding mentorship? Yeah, I, I was in on a little bit of the last panel and heard one of the panelists say that um, law school is 30% about networking. Um, and so I think that mentorships um, can happen both organically and through advocating for yourself, right? Um, if you are, um, I know for me, mentorships happen um, by me like reaching out to professors, right? And saying like, hey, I'm interested in learning more about you and the work you do and um, going to office hours, which is a little bit harder on Zoom, but still possible. Um, and then also advocating for myself um, with people who can put me in a position to gain mentorships, right? So I know the CDO office um, has mentorship programs, um, like the women in business tech, they have, right? There are different avenues in like your particular law school, um, whichever you choose that, um, you know, have resources for you to gain mentorship. But I think a lot of it um, in the legal field, at least is, a, is through networking. Um, and so when I think about people who've really been pivotal in me, um, gaining employment opportunities or um, helping me kind of get to that next level. It's been um, through me advocating for myself, right? And um, following up, right? And I'm, I'm doing interviews. I'm following up all people that I've interviewed with and say, hey, like, thank you for interviewing me. Like, especially if I liked them, like, yeah, I really want to keep in touch. And then holding true to that, right? Really keeping in touch. Um, and so, you know, I think that you know, if you really, if you're really invested in building mentorship, right, you can't be shy about advocating for yourself. Um, and, and especially if people that you're connecting with that you really think you would benefit from their tutelage, um, then it's really important that you reach out and say, um, you know, I think you'll have valuable insight here. And I really could use your help, right, doing this. So would you mind um, helping me out? And a lot of times people love it, like people love to be mentors. Um, and so for the most part, right. Um, and, and so um, it's definitely about advocating for yourself and, and networking and going to events, as many events as you can, um, and that you have the capacity for and, and building those relationships. Thank you. Um, and we'll go one more um, quick answer for Indy, <laughs> to the extent that you can make it quick, of course. How have you overcome feelings of imposter syndrome and what has helped you keep mentally healthy? Ooh, what a question. Um, so yeah, I actually recently I was told that like um, imposter syndrome, like we should just like um, push back on the idea of imposter syndrome. It's like, it's not about you feeling, it's about the space. So if you feel inadequate, um, it's not because you're inadequate, but because the space is making you feel inadequate. So just like, that's a sidebar. Like if you ever feel like you're not enough, then take a step back. And instead of like giving into that feeling, just say like, what about this space is making me feel not enough, which helps you in the long run, think about and find kind of grapple with imposter syndrome. But I, I mean, I'm 31 and I still feel imposter syndrome every other day. Um, I think that it's like, it doesn't go away. It's just like how you handle it. Um, and for me, I always constantly remind myself that these spaces aren't meant for me. These spaces have historically, um, you know, made sure that women of color, immigrants, first generation, college students, professionals aren't supposed to thrive in these spaces, aren't supposed to know the law because the law has been wielded against us, like historically. And so under that backdrop, every time I feel like I'm not enough, I'm like saying like, well, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're, you're helping build community, you're helping do all this stuff on top of academics. How are you not enough? You're like, you're a superhero pretty much. And so I try to give myself pep talks. Like Jimmy, I'm obsessed with my Peloton. I think working out and, and being active is, is important. Going on walks, running, et cetera, especially on Zoom Zoom University school of law where you can be behind your computer screen for like eight hours and realize you haven't moved your physical shell 
in hours. So I think that that's important. And I want to co-sign, underline, like a bold, italicized therapy. I think therapy is so important. And it's the reason that I am a successful, happy human being. Um, I'm an advocate about you don't need to be in crisis in order for you to go to therapy. I think that um, it's actually better for you to be in a good place and go to therapy because it makes you just be even a more stronger person. So Lean on your community, lean on resources like therapy and working out. Um, that helps you a lot when it comes to imposter syndrome, but also recognize that it's not you and it's a space um, and that will help you in the, in the long run. Wonderful. Um, that unfortunately marks time for our panel with these marvelous students today. Um, I'm very gracious just to hear um, very probed and well thought out perspectives just about the types of experiences and challenges that students of color face within the law school environment. I think it's um, even more useful to see how these folks approach um, their legal careers and their law school experiences with so much conviction and richness. Um, and I feel honored to even be asking them questions because they're all just wonderful people. Um, so if, if you could all just from the comfort of your bedroom, give them a little hand, hand, uh, round of applause, um, I'm sure they can hear it. <laughs> Not really, but um, I think I think that's uh, the the most appropriate way to wrap. Um, and now I'll be handing it off to Marissa to really close things off. Thank you all. Thank you, Lane, and thank you all for being a part of that panel. So wonderful to hear you all speak. Um, I always enjoy it. Uh, so thank you again for sharing that with us. So that is the end of our program today. Um, today, we heard from so many incredible attorneys and attorneys in the making. They were the first in their family to get a professional degree, to get an undergraduate degree, to immigrate to the United States. And although they may not have had the same upbringing as many of their law school classmates, um, everyone's been able to thrive and create some pretty incredible careers and some pretty incredible relationships. Um, so today we started with speaking with Judge Madden, who discussed how she found her space in law school and the importance of having a support system. She also discussed the importance of hustle. Uh, she told us to choose faith over fear and to go after our dreams. Lastly, she stressed how important it is for us to take care of ourselves and to find whatever type of therapy we need to manage the stressors in our life. We then had Anthony Solana and Dean Alvarez give us their incredible insight into the application process. We were told to recognize the weight of being a person of color and perhaps a first generation student, but not to let it stop us from believing that we belong at these schools and that they would be lucky to have us there. We need to be our fiercest advocates. And so they told us to take this process seriously and dedicate the time and research needed to get that best outcome apply early and get as much, as much aid as you can because you deserve it. We then had Professor Atkinson give us a little glimpse into your possible future. Uh, we did some, looked at some statutes and read some case decisions on stuff. Uh, we had our wonderful attorneys share their experiences and give us some candid advice. Uh, they told us to make sure you know why you want to come to law school. Be proud of who you are and stay true to yourself while you're here. Have a game plan what, before you come here, before you decide to take on this large amount of debt and time and energy. And if you do decide to pursue this career, help those who come after you. And lastly, we just heard from my uh, dear classmates and they told us to treat that application like a job and focus on what you need to get done dare to apply to your dream schools and don't let the numbers hold you back. Once again, advocate for yourself. And once you're in law school, surround yourself with people who get you and stay true to what your goals are, regardless of others' opinions. And once again, once you make it here, pay it forward. So that concludes Berkeley's 21st for People of Color Law School Admissions Conference. We hope you walk away today feeling empowered to apply to law school. It's a strenuous process, but we know that you can do it and this community wants to see you succeed. Another big thank you to all of our speakers today, all of my um, fellow members who helped make this conference possible and to all of you for showing up today and taking that first step. Um, as I said, we're gonna follow up with an email with all of our speakers' contact information um, and hopefully a recording of today's conference if all goes as planned. 
So we wish you all good fortune in your future applications and good health for you and your loved ones. Please um, feel free to reach out to us again as more questions come up. We are more than happy to help you. I hope we meet again soon and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you guys.